Okay, good afternoon. This is Jay Waters. I'm with the Voices of Freedom Oral History Project in the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today is 22 November 2018. It's Thanksgiving Day. And I've got the pleasure here this afternoon to be with Mr. Francis Paca, and we're in the Fort Hunt neighborhood of Virginia. Well, good afternoon, sir, and happy Thanksgiving. Oh, thank you. Same to you. Thank you, thank you. If you would, would you just give us your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Francis B. Paca, P-A-C-A. -A. Uh, my I was born in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, near New Brighton. Okay. And if you could tell us, please, what, what war did you participate in or what war was going on while you served in the military? And I served in World War II and then joined the reserves after that and retired from the reserves. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And did you have any family members, brothers, sisters, parents, other relatives that served in the military before you or with you? Well, I had uh, my... Uh, older brother and younger brother. My older brother and younger brother both joined the Marine Corps. My younger brother, unfortunately, was in the invasion of Okinawa and, and he was killed in uh, Naha, no, Okinawa. My older brother uh, had learned electronics before that and when he uh, told him that he knew about electronics. The Marine Corps sent him to uh, for math and electronics at Northeastern University and then to the uh, Naval Research Lab to, re to uh, learn sonar and radar. So he wound up spending his time at the Marine Corps Electronics Depot at Barstow, California, uh, uh, revising and uh, reconditioning all of the Marine Corps electronic equipment. Okay. Well then, uh, thinking back a little bit, so go back to December 7th, 1941. Uh, if you would just kind of tell us how old you were, where you were, and, and uh, what happened that day with the Japanese invasion of Pearl Harbor. Well, uh, if I remember right, that was a Sunday, and uh, my brothers and I had gone out uh, hunting rabbits on the prairie outside of uh, Denver, Colorado, and we came back and we heard that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, and our first question was, where in the heck is Pearl Harbor? Because <laughs> we didn't know. We had followed the war in, in uh, Britain, and to us, uh, Pearl Harbor was an unknown. And you must have been about, what, 17 years oh, old at the time? Let's see. 41, I was about 17 years old. Okay, and and you're right, it was a Sunday. Do you remember though, were schools closed the next day or what was the mood in the within your family or the community? I don't know, I really can't remember, yeah. Okay, well that's fine, well that's fine. Well then, why did you join the military? Well, I went, I was in Colorado School of Mines and at that time I was in a uh, freshman and uh, the people in Colorado School of Mines said, uh, don't, uh, don't panic, don't go in the military, we'll, we'll take care of you. And so we all enlisted in the Army uh, Engineer uh, Reserves in December 4th, 1942. And they took the whole three classes of students from Colorado School of Mines in May, of 43 and sent us to a place called Camp Abbott, Oregon, which was an engineer training center. And, and Camp Abbott was in uh, Oregon, as was, I recall, right? Was, Camp Abbott was in the south central part of Oregon, and it was a really beautiful, it was in the Deschutes National Forest, and of all the uh, army bases that I've ever seen, it is the, was the most, uh, well, the most beautiful. It is now called Sun City, and it is a tourist resort or a tourist or, or a place where people retire. Well, then, exactly, and I, I've been out there. It's a very beautiful, yeah. uh, very beautiful area. But when you were training there in uh, 1940, 
1942, maybe into 1943. What what were they teaching you? What what did you guys do? What was that like? Well, it was very well organized. We basically learned, you know, first of all, as a soldier, you had to shoot a rifle. Well, that was nothing new to me because I grew up with a rifle. I had my first rifle at age 14. But uh, they taught uh, mainly building bridges, the Bailey Bridge and the floating bridges, and then uh, 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 demolitions of how you destroy stuff and map reading and all the things that go with being an engineer. Okay. And then did you get any additional training after Camp Abbott? Uh, well, they sent a, a bunch of us. If you had been in school, college for two years, they sent you back for additional training. And I wound up in Oregon State College for a few months. Um, they said this was a, additional Army training. Well, it, you just basically went down and took the standard Army, the standard uh, college courses like uh, trigonometry and algebra and <coughs> thermodynamics and that kind of stuff. They, I think the scheme was that the Army had uh, uh, gotten in about 200,000 people more than they could cope with. They didn't have equipment, they didn't have places for them to stay, so they needed to do something in a hurry. So what they did is anybody who had had more than two years of, of college, they sent you back to school, and that was actually a holding pen. And when they needed you, bang, they got you, and I wound up in the 70th Infantry Division. Well, so what can you tell me about the, the 70th Infantry Division? Well, it was uh, a, uh, I guess they call it the, at that time, the, the, the three things. They had three of this and three, three battalions of this and three. It was based on threes instead of fours. And um, uh, it was a very good infantry division. And it was one of the few places in the Army that I felt like I had a home because you had uh, the same people around you all the time, and you got to know them very well. They uh, trained in in uh, Oregon for a while, and then we moved to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, in which uh, they um, could do training with artillery fire. And the 70th Infantry Division, I looked it up, uh, their total casualties were about uh, 8,000. They had uh, about 3,900 battle casualties. They had about 4,200 non-battle casualties, which means that they had a lot of accidents with trucks and stuff. <coughs> and I remember that in Fort Leonard Wood, uh, we were in a exercise in which we had a, a infantry regiments that were going to advance under rolling artillery fire, and somebody put the angle of the artillery in wrong and dropped the shells in amongst the uh, the um, troops. Uh, I n narrowly got involved in that, and uh, luckily came out unscathed. Mm -hmm. But that happened more times than uh, than people would like to admit, because being in a uh, uh, Arch uh, infantry division training during World War II was not a safe thing at all. No, absolutely not. Yes, yes, and with the fast paced and a lot of draftees yeah. probably were in your division yeah. as well. What was your um, what was your rank at the time? Uh, I, at that time, I was a private and uh, or PFC or whatever. And then um, they said that anybody who had gone to two years of college apply for OCS, Officer Candidate School, and I applied for it, and I'd for completely forgotten about it. And one day, the company commander said goodbye to me, and, <coughs> and I asked him, where are you going? He says, I'm not going anywhere. You're going to OCS. <laughs> so I wound up in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And what was that like for the Officer Candidate School at Fort Belvoir, Virginia? Well, it did... It was something else because you had uh, two types of officers. There was the officers 
who were the instructors that were going to uh, instruct you on basic engineer things of how to do th things, the real matter, and then the second set of officers that were attack officers that were going to harass you. <laughs> and the reason they were <coughs> going to harass you, they wanted to eliminate any candidate who uh, would break down under uh, this pressure of harassment. And several of the uh, uh, officer candidates uh, failed <coughs> part of it and were uh, dumped out because they couldn't stand the harassment. Any, anything like very unusual or funny or crazy stand out from your OCS training? Any special stories there? Oh, not really, but give me an example of harassment. Uh, one time there was snow on the ground, it was about two foot deep, and I was at a uh, platoon and I was going to give them, uh, say, column right march. So I gave them column right and I fell in the snow and I finally got my nose and eyes up above the snow and I gave them march on the right foot. The attack officer came up and said, Mr. Column right march is done in two counts, not four. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's interesting because Fort Belvoir, as you, as you know, is just 10 miles down the road from us now today. So, yeah, interesting. So, what was graduation from OCS like? Well, it was uh, something of going from being a enlisted man to being an officer. The first thing was that... Uh, the first person that you met, a listen man that saluted you, it was traditional that you gave him a dollar. So you had to have a dollar in your pocket to give this. And some of the enterprising enlisted people would just bug out because they knew there was a class graduate they would be there and they would make several bucks. But what they did next was they sent you off to a, a um, school. I wound up in... A, at Atlanta, Georgia, in an automotive maintenance school for months, and that basically was to get you to be a uh, so you weren't a square peg in a round hole, because the transition between being a enlisted man and an officer, uh, you can't do that in one day. So they give you a month to get used to it. Then I came back to Belvoir and was assigned to train troops. And right, so now you're you're a second lieutenant. Yes. At the time, and and you, any idea what you're getting paid back then? Uh, I think I was getting paid about three hundred dollars a month. But uh, an interesting thing happened is that I uh, had put in a uh, <clears throat> an <coughs> allotment or allocation from my mother when I was an enlisted man, and they kept on not getting it, not getting it even. When I was an officer, it kept on not coming through. And finally it came through, and one month I went to the pay office, and there was a full colonel standing behind me, and they paid me $800. So he said, I think I'll be a second lieutenant again to get that much money. <laughs> so I uh, went to the uh, post office, and I sent my mother a postal money order for $500. And I didn't realize it at that uh, she was in badly in need of money at mm. that time. And when that hit, that really was something for her. Well, that's that's good that you could help. And your mom was still up in Pennsylvania at this time? No, she was in California. Oh, she was in California now. Okay, okay. And when, when you were doing the uh, the training and then your assignment at Fort Belvoir, where, where were you living and what were the living conditions like? Well, they had uh, a wooden barracks uh, basically two stories. <clears throat> they had uh, officers' quarters and across the street would be the enlisted quarters in, uh, f <coughs> pardon me, for a company. So uh, you had to, as a, an officer, you had a private room that was probably about, uh, oh, eight feet by 12 feet, something like that. And you had a bed in there and a place to hang your stuff and, well, it wasn't bad at all. Sure, sure. And then within that, uh, 
uh, officer's quarter, you had a, a main uh, section that was probably about 20 by 20 where you could get together and talk. Okay, okay. Well, you mentioned that the, the 70th Infantry Division had quite a high casualty rate. <coughs> Yes. Did you yourself ever get deployed into a combat operation? Uh, no, I, n I never went overseas, but like I say, I was <coughs> almost killed in one of these friendly fire operations. Okay, right, so that was the uh, incident at Fort Leonard Wood. But, yes. but so the 70th Infantry Division uh, definitely had deployed, correct, into... Uh, they were deployed into Europe, and they were known as the Trailblazer Division. Okay, and we're going to uh, give you a glass of water there. Okay, thank you. Right. Just put it, sorry on it. Thank you. And so <clears throat> they served in, uh, I think you were telling me, perfect. I think you were telling me before you were, you were on the deployment list to go to Germany and then later to go to Japan. But Yes, when I was at, at Fort Belvoir, I graduated from OCS in about uh, the last part of of February 1945 and they said okay you're going to train troops for three months and then we're going to send you to Germany. Well about that time the war in Germany ended. So they said okay we're going to train troops for three more months and we're going to send you to Japan and about that time the war in Japan ended. So I wound up then training troops for another year and they were very very unhappy because they said there's no war going on. Why are we here? And of course, that was a question that I couldn't answer. Uh, but I said that as long as you're here, you're going to get trained. Sure. sure. I had a uh, an older gentleman who had been a, a sergeant, and uh, he said, I don't need any training. I was a sergeant. And I said, when you get a letter from group headquarters, telling me you don't need any training, then I'll quit training you. Well, the letter never came and he went through the cycle. And then a few months later, I'm standing at a bus stop waiting to go into Alexandria where my wife and I lived. And this general's great big Cadillac pulls up, honks the horn. It's my former sergeant that I, that I trained. So I got in the car and we talked talked and he let me right out in front of the house and hear all the neighbors saying, why is this second lieutenant being <laughs> driven home by a long Cadillac with the chauffeur? That was really funny. Absolutely. And then I think you told me too, you ran into one of your guys who said that you were, uh, well, what did he say about you as a trainer? Oh yes. Uh, I'd gone to a symposium one time and this fellow said, were you at Fort Belvoir? I said, yes. He said, were you training? I said, yeah. And uh, so I said, well, thinking back, how were things at that time? And so he thought and he thought, he thought, he said, at least you were fair. You treated us all the same. Well, I picked up on fair and all the same, and I figured, that's really good. I didn't bother with the real English translation, which was, you are a uniform and consistent, miserable SOB. Absolutely. But, you know, I would tell you, Frank, I think that's still a compliment at the end of the day that you are fair and consistent. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I think that's a compliment from your former trainee that you were, you were fair and consistent. I want to go back for a second, though. You mentioned uh, the ending of World War II and then in particular the ending of uh, the war in Japan. So... This probably would have been August of 1945. Tell us about your recollection and what, what you were told as a probably first lieutenant about the bombings in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What, what, what were they telling you back in those days? Well, they just uh, tried to describe an atomic bomb and very few of the enlisted men in the group understood this at all. And I fortunately had had physics in Colorado School of Mines and I was trying to tell them that, well, in physics and chemistry, most of the uh, reactions were with the valence electron on the top of a, a tata, atom, and this was uh, involving the uh, reaction with the things that were in the core of an atom, the neutrons and protons, and it was a much different reaction and much more energetic. 
and it was the corn was with Einstein's E energy equals MC squared equation and I think they understood a little bit better then that that was a, a way to get much much more energy. Uh, they I told about the, the bombing and uh, showed pictures of the uh, destruction which was very very great. Was there talk at the time, you remember, of, of, of an actual invasion of Japan that maybe the 70th or other units would have been involved had we not dropped nuclear bombs? Yes, they were, they were planning an invasion. And I later on worked for a fellow who was in the colonel in the Marines, and he told me that they were ready to go. And he said he was very thankful when that happened because the... the uh, the estimated casualties on an invasion of Japan were sometime <clears throat> estimated like a million. This, the uh, Allied for forces plus the Japanese, absolutely, at least being a million dead. Absolutely. Well, so I always see in the in the newsreels and 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 Life magazine these giant post World War II parades in New York City and Washington, D.C. Were you, were you a part of any of those things, the, the, the post-war uh, no, celebration? I, no, no. Okay, or could you just tell us then about your demobilization then in, uh, in probably, what, 1946? Yeah, well, I, uh, you had to get out on points. Uh, you got so many points for, uh, um, for being overseas, you got so many points for having a wife, and so many points for having a child, and so many points for being in the United States. Well, I didn't have very many points, so I wound up getting uh, out of the Army in September of 46, and my separation place was the Pentagon. So I uh, went into the Pentagon and got separated, and. They said, you, you want to join the reserves? And I said, well, I was in the enlisted reserve, so I joined the uh, officer's reserves, reserve officer's corps. And finally, after about 28, 30 years of that, I retired from that as, as lieutenant colonel. Which is uh, very admirable. Um, but from, so from your time from 1946 until when you retired as a lieutenant colonel in the reserves, what, what kind of things did you do in the, in the reserves? Uh, I was in a, uh, the Fort Belvoir and the Engineer Research and Development Labs. So uh, they had a reserve unit there that went on uh, reserve duties that were very uninteresting and I thought they were mundane. So. I generally went by myself and picked out ones that were were more interesting and more uh, educational. I uh, like I went on one at, to the ballistics research labs of Aberdeen. I went on two to the office of the uh, uh, scientific advisor in the Pentagon and uh, things like that. I would just pick pick my unit that I want to go to. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, then, in addition to your your reserve career, what did you do then as a uh, civilian? What was your civilian career? Well, I stayed probably working for the military for thirty three years at Fort Belvoir, and uh, a large portion of that I was in the landmine clearing. And uh, during that time, I got to participate in the detonation of the three atomic bombs. Wow. Uh, the last one, we had put out 5,000 landmines, of which 1,000 were live landmines, and was going to be hit by a 40K atomic bomb on a balloon. And then we had to determine, uh, we wanted to know what distance for each landmine uh, would 10% go off, would 50% go off and 90% go off, and our test was pretty much a, a success. Okay, wow, that, that's I mean, that's that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, so you mentioned landmines, and today is Thanksgiving. I think before you mentioned a story about a turkey farm and, and booby traps. Could you yeah. tell us that story, please? Yes, uh, my uh, aunt and uncle lived in uh, across in. Uh, 
across the Chesapeake Bay and they raised turkeys. And they had hundreds of turkeys, but right when Thanksgiving time, I, the locals would steal a lot of them. So I uh, got some, uh, I was a second lieutenant at Belvoir, and I got some old booby traps that were going to be thrown away. They were training and they were sort of rusty. And so I got some steel wool and oil and got them working again. And, Took them over there and I booby trapped the uh, turkey pen and uh, my uh, aunt, somebody was delivering some food or some uh, food for the turkeys and she says, just a second, I've got to fix these booby traps. My, uh, my nephew who's in the army booby trapped the turkey pen. So she goes in there and manipulates this booby trap, takes it off. No turkeys were lost that year. Well, that's good, and I'm sure the, the turkeys would thank you for that too, right? <laughs> At least initially. And I think um, earlier too, you told us about um, a story about voting and your commanding officer about who was going to vote. Yes. What happened uh, there? Um, it was in 19, I guess 1944. They, uh, remember, they were trying to get the vote out, so uh, the company commander out and he says, anybody going to vote? Anybody not going to vote, hold up their hand. And this guy holds up his hand. And so they say, <coughs> go in and see the company commander. So finally he goes in and sees the company commander. The company commander gives him a pep talk of why he should vote. He said, now why aren't you going to vote? He said, I'm not 21. Because <laughs> that was the voting age. He says, well, why didn't somebody, uh, why did somebody send you in here? He said, nobody asked me. Exactly, yeah, so the, the, the voting age 21 versus yes. now voting age of uh, 18. Um, did you receive any any awards either for yourself or for your unit during your active duty time or your reserve time? Oh, these were just the little awards like good conduct and serving in the uh, uh, United States, American defense and a few like that. Sure, there. sure. Yeah. Well, and what about, um, you know, again, retiring as a lieutenant colonel out of the Army Reserve? Did you have a retirement ceremony? Could you tell us a little bit about that? No, that was uh, nothing. They just sent you a sheet of paper. Wow. They basically said, uh, uh, you're ret retired, this and that. Uh, oh, one thing I meant to tell you, um, during my uh, career as a reserve officer, the sent me a letter saying that uh, I've been put in the standby reserve because McNamara came out with this thing called the Key Personnel Act. And that meant that if your civilian job was more important than anything that could give you any position in the military, then you probably could not be uh, draft or transferred because that would not make sense. So you were called key personnel and you were transferred to the standby reserve and that sort of ended your reserve activity. Okay, so that would have probably been in the like 60s during the Vietnam War, I would think, with, oh, with uh, Secretary McNamara. Probably later than that, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, well, you, sh uh, you showed me your War Department ID card. Yeah. Why don't you hold that up for the camera? And Well, it's upside down there. Uh, we'll think you're... There you go. So um, tell us a little bit about that, because I guess you pointed out something that at first glance I didn't notice. Across the top here, uh, in very small print, it says not a pass for identification only, not identification. It says identification card, but for identification only. And the, the reason they told us was that if the Germans had got this card and counterfeited, they would have spelled that correctly. And that therefore, anybody who had a card where that was spelled correctly was suspect. Or the second story was somebody at the government printing office was printing away and said, oh heck, nobody's going to see that mistake. Well, Frank, after all these years to ponder that, that dilemma, what, what do you think the truth is? I don't know. You don't know. Okay. I kind of like the first yeah, version. The first of is a more 
romantic one. Well, I'll do some. Uh, I'll do some research on that and yeah. uh, see if we can find anything else out about that. Um, well, how do you think your 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 military service in the forty three to forty six affected you through the rest of your life? I think that uh, the uh, things they pounded into me on management, small item management, small thing management that they pounded into you in OCS probably stayed with me the rest of my life. Because in an officer candidate school for an engineer, you had to, to go out and, you know, do work on small things first and they really pounded it into you the, the how to organize and execute small projects. Okay, that's good. Well, this and this question is definitely not on the on the script. But my wife and I go hiking a lot down at Fort Belvoir, and I go out in some of those backwoods, the munitions, and some of these bridges were built by engineer units back in the '50s and '60s. Were you part of any of that out there? No. no. But do, have you seen those hiking trails and bridges out yes, there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. guess I thought maybe that you and your guys maybe built some of that stuff. No. Okay. Uh, well, I've only got two questions left, so we're we're close to the finish line here. Um, I guess just looking across the whole spectrum of your of your career and everything that you've done, is there one thing you would want? you know, future generations of, of the American public to know about you and your, your military service? I'd have to think about that a while uh, because, see, uh, uh, as an engineer, you're, you're still one of the combat arms, but uh, uh, I think that... Uh, uh, well, you know, they're, they're right now they're trying to get rid of guns and stuff. I think that what they need to do is train more young people to properly use guns, rifles especially, because if it's an ever war, uh, this uh, quickly training people to use rifles is, is not very good because uh, uh, rifles on the on the firing lines on a on a uh, you know you go down to the to pick out a uh, a range and you're going to fire on the range that's a lot of difference than actually firing a rifle. In fact, uh, I had a bunch of uh, recruits from Brooklyn that never seen a gun. They didn't know which way the bullet came out, and they would point the gun down there, and as they pulled the trigger, they'd go like that. Well, you know, that's just stupid. And uh, I had a steel drift pin, which is about that long and about that wide, half inch wide. And I would look under their helmet and I'd bang them on the helmet to keep their eyes open, sight the rifle. And, and this was, they were afraid of the gun. And uh, to, to train uh, kids to be not afraid of a rifle, they got to shoot a rifle. Well, and some of these soldiers you were training at uh, Fort Belvoir must have been draftees as well, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, so it was not necessarily an all-volunteer army. In oh, fact, no. it was largely a draftee no. army. Yeah, that's, uh, well, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, I'm down to the proverbial last question, and we're probably moments away from dessert and coffee at the table. But uh, is there anything else you'd like to to cover or, or add to the interview or, or go back to that we didn't already discuss? Oh, let's see. No, I don't, don't think so. Uh, I think that basically, uh, I, I think that what I did in the Army was useful in training because I trained an awful lot of people and uh, uh, in training that many troops, only, out of, only one of them came back and he says, Lieutenant, I think I know what you're trying to do. And I said, what was that? He says, you're trying to make us good soldiers and make us so we can survive World War II. And I said, that's right. Absolutely. And I think uh, Frank, like the other sergeant, had said to you that you were 
you were fair and consistent, which maybe meant other things, yeah. but I think that's a great compliment yeah. to what you did for the yeah. war effort. Well, absolutely outstanding. I would, uh, I'm going to reach across and shake hands with you. Thank Frank, you. This was a pleasure for me and uh, a great way to wrap up the afternoon of Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm.